Welcome everybody uh, to CITP Lunch Talk. Today's speaker is uh, someone who will be familiar to many of you. He's a longtime friend of the center and a visiting research collaborator for the last couple of years at least. Uh, Steve Rosa is uh, an attorney. He is at Holland and Knight in New York. Yep. Um, specializing in data privacy and he's going to talk to us about the new final rule on COPPA, the kids um, privacy law. Great. Thanks, Ed. So, um, so great, great to be here. And why COPPA? And why the final rule? And COPPA's been around for a while. But uh, in December, there was a new final rule that the FTC issued uh, in a vote of three to one with one commissioner uh, dissenting and one abstaining uh, to issue a new final rule. And this new final rule uh, is probably the most sweeping and important uh, regulation or legal change regarding the internet in the United States in the past 10 years. Uh, there's certainly been, you know, in and, and so why is that the case? And the reason is, for well, there's a couple reasons. One is the new rule, and we're going to go through this in some detail, expands the scope of who's covered. Before, you could count on just being, well, I'm a very kid-directed website. I'm a very, uh, you know, child-centered app developer. So I know that I'm covered by COPPA. But th that landscape has now completely changed. Um, if you're a mixed audience site, or if you have a small portion of your site dedicated um, uh, to kids-related content, then you are absolutely swept in under the new rule. That's reason one. Uh, reason two is um, the nature of what constitutes a violation under COPPA has radically changed under the new rule. Uh, the, we're going to talk about the the definition of personal information and how that's changed under COPPA. Uh, it's, it's changed in unexpected ways. That, that term no longer carries its conventional and plain uh, meaning. And then also in terms of parties, in terms of scope, there's also third parties, uh, uh, peop, uh, entities that are in the advertising or analytics business or social networks. And uh, if they're collecting information, they can also be liable in certain circumstances under COPPA as well too. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and breeze through as quickly as possible uh, what are the major changes and what's the new landscape under COPPA, what does that look like. Uh, then for the second half of the talk, um, what I'd like to do is talk about what are some of the uh, potential unintended consequences of the new COPPA rule and what it might mean for kids' content on the web. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to talk just at the very end for a little bit about um, sort of very interesting uh, legal issues around the promulgation of this rule, uh, in particular whether or not it's actually authorized under the existing COPPA statute and whether we might see a lawsuit around that issue uh, in this in, in 2013. Um, if anyone has any questions or thoughts and want to shout it out during the presentation, don't hesitate. Sure. Final. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, is there an old final? Well, no, it's the new, new final. It's the new, new final, right? No, it's the. That's a great point. And the reason, no, it's just the final. But there was sort of this very hiccupy process where there was a proposed final rule, and then there was a, another proposed final rule, and so, so the the sort of multi iteration process has, you know, changed the way we talk. So, okay, it's what we're talking about. Okay, so um, first under COPPA, under the new rule, is uh, in terms of who's covered, um, and it's whether or not you collect information uh, uh, on uh, children under 13 under the web, um, and that makes you a COPPA operator. And in particular, whether or not you're directed to children. If you're a website, or an app that's directed to children, how do we know this? And there's no really bright line test. And so the question of whether or not you're directed to children will be um, uh, if you have uh, kid-related ads, uh, kid-related content, uh, uh, cartoons, if you rely heavily on cartoons that are kid-oriented cartoons. So it's a totality of the circumstances uh, test, the look and feel of the website, the look and feel um, of the app. And as we noted, as I noted in the introduction, um, it's not just a question of whether you're overall 
website um, is kid directed, but perhaps whether only a portion of it, or if you're a mixed audience site that might fairly sweep in uh, uh, demographics older than 13 as well as younger than 13. If we look at the Amtrak site, many of us have probably used this. You know, is this child directed? Well, you know, of course not. The under 13 crew isn't going to go on here and purchase uh, train tickets. Um, but what about now? now? This is also on the Amtrak website, and they have a whole suite of uh, special games that you can play if you're a kid and sort of educational stuff about trains and whatnot. And under the new, um, uh, let me just say something too. All of the folks that we talk about in this discussion, we don't represent. My firm doesn't currently represent uh, <laughs> as clients, so um, so that's why, in part, why we're talking about them. But uh, so uh, under the new uh, version of of COPPA, the the final rule, the new final rule, or just the final rule, um, Amtrak's in the mix, um, and there's a lot of websites that are that that are like this, and it it greatly expands the reach so, so of COPPA. Sure. Are you saying that? That part of their site is covered by COPPA, or the whole site? This part of the site. So if they're gathering data on this part of the site, then it will be covered? You're, you're in. They're in the mix, yeah. And uh, in a couple of slides, we'll talk about uh, kind of some of the problems that can arise from that uh, in terms of what you do on that site and how you operate that portion of the site with respect to the rest of what you do. So. Uh, if you're child directed and you violate COPPA, um, do you get to say, well, I didn't mean to do it, um, I got some type of defense? No. If you collected information in violation of the act, you're strictly liable, uh, especially if you are a first party operator. So if you are, if it's your website or your app and you're collecting information on children uh, in violation of COPPA, uh, then you are liable. If, you're a, if you are a third party, um, then the question is, do you have actual knowledge um, that you are collecting information on children on, uh, under 13? And this issue of actual knowledge for third parties is going to get very dicey. Um, let's say if you're uh, Facebook um, and there are first party sites that have the, the like button or some of the, the, you know, the Facebook uh, uh, connect or Facebook social plugins, um, you know, how is Facebook going to have actual knowledge that that's placed on a, uh, a child-directed site? Um, you know, where you could uh, add this would be another uh, example of that type of plug-in or widget. And, and the actual knowledge standard doesn't really answer that. It's the, the FTC made it clear that it's supposed to be a high standard. It's not sort of like, you know, you browse the internet generally or it's a really big site, so you should know. But you can kind of imagine what's going to happen on July 1st when the COPPA rule becomes effective. Um, and you could imagine public interest groups perhaps putting together an affidavit and saying, look, uh, you know, we're experts uh, on internet stuff and we've looked at this website and, and you know, the, the like button or the add this widget is all over it and uh, we've signed an affidavit to that effect. We're sending it to the FTC. We're sending it to uh, Facebook or the company in question. And now, is that actual knowledge? I don't know, but you could certainly see this as sort of causing all sorts of problems as to what you know and don't know if you're a third-party operator. I think Ed, this is the problem. Sure, the go ahead. Is, I am running a website directed to children. I have on my website advertising analytics or some such. Mm -hmm. If when a child visits my website, Google or Facebook or whoever that was, had a log entry. And they should have known because we told them, by the way, you know, some of the people who click on the site and who your logs are reflecting are children. And the intent of the rule is that no action ever done by a child will ever enter a log file. Uh, think about a cookie. Yeah. So uh, you you download the the like button um, when I or I download the like button when I go to your website. If I'm under 13, you're going to set a cookie in my browser, and then you're going to track me to which other sites I go to that have like buttons. And now you're tracking me across the web, but that behavior is forbidden by this rule. Well, you could, I mean, you can talk about, start with the, or a simple first party scenario, right? COPPA basically applies where one or two things is true. Either the site is directed to kids, mm -hmm. which you've talked about, or mm -hmm. if you have actual knowledge that that user is a kid. Yeah, and right? I don't think so I So the question here is how that applies to the third party case. Exactly. 
I don't think I quite followed. Like, if the rule does apply, what does the rule forbid? So, the, what the rule? Well, that's a great point. And <laughs> so, what the rule forbids is the collection of personal information about the child. We'll talk about the definition of personal information uh, presently, but um, it forbids it in the absence of parental consent. Uh, you can absolutely collect the information and do whatever you want to do if you have obtained verifiable parental consent under the rule. And if you haven't obtained the consent, then you can be subject to a $16,000 per violation fine, um, which in the case of uh, Artist Arena, um, which was, I think, a settlement around, announced in 2012, was a million-dollar hit for, for the company. Um, and then recently with... Uh, 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 the the PATH mobile app that was uploading contact information had uploaded um, information uh, from children and there was they actually knew it because they had dates of birth and things like this they didn't weed weed it out they didn't get consent and they got hit for an eight hundred thousand dollar fine so this is this is um you know even for medium to big size companies this is a um, a big deal and certainly for for smaller operators as well yeah. Questions too technical, but um, so following on Ari's question, so you're you're a child site. You use Google Analytics. Um, Google perhaps doesn't know that you're a child site, but you, well, you sign up with a domain, but they're probably not vetting each domain. Um, Google is actually collecting the data. Yeah. You have login to Google's site. So right. So um, so that's not too technical. Too technical of a question. That's exactly the type of question that. That's you know squarely at issue, and uh, one of the things we'll look at, but we can flag now, is uh, there is a carve out for certain types of um, third party collection of information or collection of information generally. And one is if it's necessary for the support support and maintenance of the website or product. So I you know, and although no one has come out that I know of, certainly no one you know cloaked an authority from the FTC and said, look, Google Analytics is out of the mix. I would think if there's any, you know, that would that would certainly be um, high up on the list for a third party that might be carved out for that particular function. It's not online behavioral advertising. It's supposedly, um, if you ask Google, they say that all of the information collected through Google Analytics is always anonymous state, that they don't use it as part of their, you know, repurpose it for part of their ad, you know, services and whatnot. So there's, there, I, it may be exempted. That particular one. Following on that, is is the idea that suppose you have a Facebook like button on your child or the site or by Facebook, does Facebook do something different where they say, ah, I know this URL or this domain um, is a child site, so we are not we're going to do things differently with that like button. Is that technically what is expected to happen, or so um, to <coughs> comply with the rule, what what Facebook could do is they could immediately delete data that came from what they had actual knowledge to be a child-directed site, okay. um, and they would not run afoul of the rule. One of the ways you can, you know, uh, kind of maintain compliance is if you immediately delete, you know, okay. data. But they'd have to do something like, like that or block it or something. Um, so personal information. Um, Historically, under COPPA, personal information is what you would expect. First and last name, date of birth, address, things like that. And um, if you look on the FTC website, you can see a whole uh, history of uh, COPPA actions where the collection of that type of information was precisely at issue. And various companies got their bell rung for violating um, uh, the rule as it existed. But what's changed with the final rule is that uh, now we've got geolocation information, um, uh, various types of photo, uh, you know, audio files, and then persistent identifiers. And persistent identifiers, it's amazing how big a category the FTC has set this out to be. Um, they include uh, certainly hardware address identifiers, uh, randomly assigned uh, unique identifiers and cookies, IP addresses, um, uh, processor serial numbers, et cetera, et cetera, anything that would enable uh, a, uh, a first party or a third party to track you over time or track you across the web. Or did they make it up yesterday? 
What, uh, did they make it? That's a good. They, I think, if you ask the FTC, they would take the position that this, the I, the I, this idea was sort of latent within a statute or within, um, uh, you know, what what was originally complicated, uh, contemplated within the breadth of, of of the statute. But for all practical purposes, this is really something new. Um, so. We talked about um, carve-outs uh, and exemptions. Uh, if you're going to use a uh, persistent identifier, unique identifier, to do authentication or to help with security um, and in, with certain types of child contact uh, to uh, help engender compliance with the rule, then, then that's carved out and you're fine. But um, I'm sorry, I'm in the way of the slides. So, uh, but anyway, you can see that with, you know, this is a huge change from personal information like, you know, it's me to, you know, if you're collecting, if I have an app and uh, Flurry Analytics is collecting my UDID, um, then, you know, do they, do they know it's me? Well, they probably don't know unless, unless Flurry is also collecting um, my device name, which most of the time they're not. They won't know it's me from my UDID. I mean, this is kind of a contra This is really a controversial thing. Yeah, That's Josh. Just a, a question about the third-party collection, and also, about, I guess, about this is the the thing that strikes in in my mind uh, most directly is the parallel with HIPAA, um, which has a similar but uh, subtly different, irritatingly different um, regime. And so, in HIPAA, there's a there's an obligation actually, if you're collecting the data, that if the data gets shared with a third party, you have to let them know that it's subject to restrictions. Um, is there's no similar obligation in the COPPA rule? To, to, for example, to, to say I'm a covered operator under COPPA. So, so uh, COPPA does uh, impose, um, along with the parental consent obligation, notice obligations. So uh, if you're at a child-directed site or, or you have a portion of your website that's child-directed, um, you would you'd be required to give notice about your information collection practices in a way that's compliant with uh, COPPA as well as obtain consent. So it's not as I would say it's not it's not nearly as rigorous as in the HIPAA context, but um, but never, nevertheless there is this notice event that's and you know and and, and consent event that's supposed to happen. You don't have to just give notice. You know, if you put a like button on your child directed site, you don't have to send Facebook a letter that says, by the way, I'm a child directed site. No. Um, but you can see, I mean, so you have so you have this website, and let's say you're a mixed audience type site, but with a portion of your website, uh, or, or you just have a portion of your website, like in the Amtrak example, that's dedicated to kids' content. Um, and and so all of a sudden, now under COPPA, um, let's say you have to get uh, you have to age gate to find out whether or not your user is above the age of 13. And then let's say they're, in fact, not above the age of 13. You either then have to not serve them uh, additional content, obtain parental consent, or not collect any information. So then you're talking about really having two sets of different content that you might serve in the, in the instance of a mixed audience site. You've got your, I'm not going to collect any information if I'm, um, uh, if the end user's a child. Uh, but I can go ahead and do whatever I want if the end user's uh, not a child. Um, so anyway, yeah, the the, um, the carve outs in terms of the you know the content. There used to be um, a uh, I don't know if it was a carve out was the right thing, but if you were like a nonprofit, suppose you had a little league website. But it was, you know, it's going to have schedules and games and maybe some photos or something. So you could expect that some of the kid players are going to visit the site. It wasn't necessarily designed for kids, but you know, you, you have a reasonable expectation they'd be visiting. Is there still some kind of little exemption for these nonprofits? Yeah, that's a good question. Traditionally, the FTC enforcement authority is limited to commercial enterprises and doesn't apply to not-for-profit. I think it's also true for COPPA. I'd have to look at that. Um, so uh, COPPA also there's a there's a um, there's an increased emphasis on security uh, now both with respect to the collection of information by first parties but also 
what third parties might do, whether they're vendors, uh, third party hosted solutions, et cetera, uh, with the personal information that uh, you collect if you're covered. And keep in mind, too, so we're not just talking about names anymore and uh, addresses. We're talking about strings included in cookies, UDIDs. So the scope of the security obligation has, like the scope of the personal information collection obligation, uh, really expanded. So um, just sort of for kicks and bricks, I took a look at uh, uh, transit security for Lego and the Megablocks websites, just to get an idea of what the state of affairs is right now um, on the web, at least with respect to uh, security for information in transit. And let's see if this works. Let's see here. Right. Yeah, okay. So here's that's Mega Blocks. Okay, Mega Blocks first. So, so this is Mega Blocks, and uh, we're running Wireshark in the background. I put in my uh, date of birth as um, uh, as an adult. But if you you get the same experience if you're if you enter it and you're a kid. Uh, email address, password, feels like there should be some music or some accompaniment, maybe to like the sounds of a kazoo or something. But um, So anyway, you enter your information and... We never did that. I knew about Hello Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> so like Power Rangers, Hello Kitty, etc. And so in Wireshark, it turns out that the username, password, and um, uh, date of birth are all transmitted in the clear and unencrypted to, to Megablocks. So, um, and so the reason I, I note that, though, is, you know, so on the one hand, we have COPPA that has sort of made these very, you know, or the FTC that's invoked this very arcane set of restrictions now on, you know, uh, persistent identifiers, UDIDs, and all this, and we've got, you know, big time child directed sites on the web that don't even encrypt passwords and date of birth and things like that. And so I would suggest that in terms of the compliance effort that needs to be undertaken, both on the collection side and on the security side, is going to be a big one. Um, I'm not going to show the Lego site. Lego is just the opposite. Lego actually encrypts their date of birth and their password. And, and all the rest. So um, I'm not implying any superiority of Legos over Megablocks. So notice requirements. Um, uh, as we talked about, there's the notice requirement that you have to uh, provide um, uh, both under the old rule but under the new rule as well. Um, I won't get too much into the weeds on that, but uh, the slides will be available if, if anyone is interested in the details on the notice obligation. Uh, parental consent. So um, parental consent, most typically, that you see right now consists of uh, email plus. So if a child goes on a website and wants to access the kid's content, um, you have to uh, provide your parent's email. Your parent gets an email. They have to OK it. Um, and the new rule adds uh, some additional options. And I think they wanted to add additional, the FTC wanted to add additional options because they realized that uh, the obligations really become much more burdensome and the scope of what they're covering has really expanded. But I'm not sure they've actually necessarily achieved it with options such as video conferencing. So if I you know, go onto the Disney website, you know, are they going to say, okay, you know, Steve Rosa wants his son now to, be, to access Disney content. Let's get him on a video conference. You need the consent only if you're then going to do behavioral advertising to children. It wouldn't just have to be behavioral advertising. It's, it would be any type of information collection except for sort of a narrow strip of stuff. You know, could probably might be able to do analytics without getting a crown consent or you know authentication things like that. But but I, but social networks, OBA, and you know there's a, a so yeah. It's not as narrow as. If I just, just had like a website with static content and logs in the background, I'm not. 
like actually collecting anything very detailed about the children and not doing anything particularly with the mother and dad. Yeah. And that, right? Well, you in um, in, in theory you would be. I mean, there, the IP address is included as a persistent okay. identifier, but there's an exemption for necessary for network communication. So you I'm can that Amtrak website where I'm yeah. pitching content to children, but not recording. But I'm not uh, doing any advertising. Using it, and those logs just stay as logs for my internal use. I don't need critical consent like that. And you don't have any third party collection going on? Yeah. Or if I do, it's only for uh, right stuff that's carved out or exempt. No, I think you'd have a really good position then that your compliance obligation under the rule is met. Is there a sense as to whether this is intended to be preventative or, or sort of punitive? Um, like, is this legislation so that? You know, on the day it becomes, it goes into effect, the people start suing all sorts of companies, and you know, or is it is it more like when something bad happens, then we can say, oh well, this is actually illegal, and here's why, and now there's someone who's culpable. Right. So that's a great point, and um, it's not actually legislation. This is this squarely falls under the sort of tyranny of the administrative agency, although not, you know, maybe that's too strong a word, but no one voted. There's no one that you elected that voted. For this rule. This was the FTC issuing uh, a rule under its delegated Con statute. Congress order. voted to give the FTC authority to make a rule in this area. Yes, they did. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Rulemaking authority. That's right. Uh, and and with administrative law, I mean, it's really administrative law is the probably one of the most significant developments in the past hundred years for law because what it does is it sort of gets Congress out of some very tight spots of having to pass controversial rules, dumps it off to an administrative agency, and uh, uh, but anyway, so and in terms of the question of what happens on July 1st, is it punitive? There are certainly there's penalties in place that are meant to be, uh, you know, and you know to create disincentives. There is no private right of action under COPPA, so you can't go in as a per, as a private individual and sue. The FTC can enforce. Um, I'm the Lego company. I am trying to do subtle behavioral advertising to sell plastic to children. I say, hey, kids, if you want to use this website, you need a signed permission slip. Print this form and sign it and just send us in the scanned form and we're done. And I don't have to check that they parents signed it. I just, somebody signed it. Right. I mean, the, the verifiable parental consent, it's, you know, it doesn't, it's not to the point of, you know, you're, saying that, driver's license. you're saying that any child raised enough to forge a parental signature can speak past this. I would say so. Because no well, not any child, but if you have a child that's right, if you have a child that's capable of, you know, uh, you know, perhaps creating a fictitious email account, uh, say it's my parents or whatever. Yes. Yeah. This isn't. This is. This is meant to be a reasonable bar, but not. Uh, like said, not. A, you know, I, not something that's so tight. And here's what. Disney's looks like for Club Penguin. Um, you can see that you know they ask for the parental email address. You can shot an email, and if you have kids that that like this type of content, you know this is um, uh, you know this is this is the type of thing you deal with all the time. And you have to get the email, and then you try and bring it up on your smartphone. It's not optimized for your smartphone. You can't get the consent, and your kid's upset and all that. But and which is actually, and I say that to, in part to be flip. But when you put this type of barrier up in front of content, um, this, is actually, this is actually a big deal in terms of economics because this dramatically reduces the amount of, um, uh, the amount of traffic that you're going to have or the amount of kids that will enroll. Um, we counsel clients around this, and, and one of our clients, who's a name that you'd immediately recognize and has a portion of their website that's dedicated exclusively to Flash-based games, um, and has all sorts of third parties on it and whatnot, they're, you know, they're not sitting back saying, well, um, uh, you know, how, how are we going to get consent? And that, They're like, if we're covered by COPPA, that part of the site's gone. And I'm going to get to that, but I think you know, that's one of the unintended consequences of COPPA, is that if you have a site that otherwise has a line of business or has a lot of content, makes their money some other way, um, there's going to be content directed to kids. That's it, it's you know who wants to face the you know being on the front page of the Wall Street Journal and you know or, or getting you know sued or etc. So the content goes. Um, that's not every case you know, but but at the margin, um, it's an issue, I think, or could be an issue, um, or it would be a good issue for someone to research at the graduate student level in a place like Princeton. <clears throat> 
splash page before you come to that says, you know, if you're over 13, click here, otherwise, <laughs> click here. Yeah, if you're, you know, if you're a mixed audience site, um, uh, you can use age gating, uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and you'll see that where you have to, and there's, you can enter your date of birth and then you're, you're, you're fine. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's one way to comply in certain situations under COPPA. The question then becomes is what do you do when, um, if you're a site that's predominantly, or a portion of a website that's predominantly aimed at kids, uh, and if almost everyone is going to be under age, uh, you know, then you'd have to get the parental consent. And in the absence of that, you couldn't have any of the, of the third parties on that part of your website. So any ability to monetize that part of the website, for the most part, with the exception of contextual advertising, but for the most part, the economics get difficult. Right. Well, let's say that yeah. That like 14, 15, 16 year olds, you don't want to deal with parental consent. Can you like ask the users? You're over 13, right? Right. Is so that I, like there's even even without entering your date of birth, alcohol does this, right? <laughs> right, right. Because you don't need to know their date of birth. You just need to know if they're over 13 or under 13. Well, there's actually there's actually an issue is when you age gate. If you're, for example, if you're not a mixed audience site, but you if you're a child directed site, you um, the better practice would be actually to ask for the date of birth and not have a click off box that says, "Hey, I'm over, Why I'm over 13." Now you definitely have a piece of personal identifiable information that you don't want to have. Yeah, I mean you have to drill down on the notice requirements and the consent requirements, but I think there's that uh, depending on whether you're a mixed audience site or a child directed site, you have to get, you have to have a more rigorous age gate. Why is this rigorous? I mean, you know, twelve year olds are able to figure out. <laughs> well, no. Well, here's the rigorous part: is I um, if, if I have a pre check box, if I have a pre check box. Hey, I'm over thirteen. <clears throat> you know. Maybe a kid reads that, maybe they don't. A lot of them probably click straight through. If you enter your date of birth, there's a fair amount of research out there that says kids are actually going to enter their right date of birth. Although, uh, we can all ask ourselves the question as to whether or not that's actually a sound security practice that you want your child providing personal information. And, whether, and it would be worth researching whether you get the novel sent to January 1st and, and February 29th, which is what I <laughs> which is what I do. Which is what I do when people ask me for my date of birth, but when well, I'm not interested in them. Sure. sure. I mean, there's there's an interesting real world analog. You go to Wegmans if you want to buy alcohol. They want to see your driver's license because they type in your date of birth. I never got that. Okay, so I six, think that's a, a, a compliance issue <coughs> internally for them. I think the idea yeah. is that by making them type in the date of birth, they can check sure on the cashiers and make sure that the cashiers are checking. I reduce their life. So uh, $16,000 per violation. This is, this is noteworthy because the FTC, actually under Section 5 of its enabling statute, um, doesn't have authority to, uh, to issue penalties unless someone has violated a consent decree uh, or, or an established standard. In the case of COPPA, um, uh, that counts as sort of there being an established standard. So if you violated it, you're actually on the hook for penalties. Uh, it can add up pretty quick at sixteen thousand dollars per violation. Um, okay, impact and potential unintended consequences. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Is there a process for coming up with a number like that, or I mean, is it just you know a number is chosen from a you know picked out of a hat or something? It, it was eleven thousand for a while. I'm not sure what the calculus was. Okay. Ed, Ed, are you familiar with that? What was it? Yeah, some, <laughs> this is a number that the Congress emitted at some point in time. Oh, I see. Okay. But it, that number was set Some congressional staff. Oh, the number is legislated by Congress. Yeah. Okay. okay. The increase to the 16,000? I believe that. I, that I would make sense if it I believe the 16,000 yeah. number came from Congress, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, so. So this is Office Jerk, um, which is a favorite app for the under 13 crowd, especially for boys. And so in the background, this is, uh, this is proxy software running at the same time that one's playing the iPad app. And you get to throw stuff at the, at the poor guy who's sitting in the chair at his computer. But um, you can see that, uh, that the third parties here at issue, and this is a free app, uh, 
Hazap, Flurry, Playhaven, AdMob, uh, AdTilt, which is a, a, um, a name that uh, Ad Colony uses, ChartBoost, TapJoy Ads. You know, all of those are third parties that, in one way or another, um, uh, are part of the monetization framework for for free apps. And so, um, you know, under the new, and this would probably, I mean, this is a cartoon-based game uh, that's pretty simple to play, and you know, it wouldn't uh, made by Fluic um, wouldn't take much, I think, to to take the position that that's going to be squarely covered as child-directed under the final COPPA rule. And um, so then the question becomes is, well, are they going to get ver verifiable parental consent um, uh, in order to, to do all this, or does all of this disappear? And they're in the position where I think they would probably have to get the, the consent if they want to have a free app, because otherwise they can't do any of the stuff that that pays for them to do what they do, to make apps. Um, uh, I'm going to, in the interest, well, you know what? In terms, yeah, sure, go ahead. In a case like that, let's say I, I make an app, which is a game, and I, I sort of, in my mind, think that it's going to be, you know, hot among 16-year-olds. But then it turns out that it sells really well, uh, you know, for kids under and so when I build it, I put in all of this third-party um, ad integration because I think, oh, it's not a problem. Um, but then it turns out to be a problem. Um, yeah, so you're, you're now under COPPA, and, and the fact that you designed it or even declared it to be for, for older kids is, is nice but um, invisible. <laughs> what do you do? The yeah. software is out the door. What if, I, yeah. Yeah, what if I slap a rating on it that says 16 plus? Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, no, it's someone has bought it's it's actually enforced by an app store and is using it. And it's doing None all of the app stores market. enforce their ratings. See, oh, that's the app store's problem, not the developers. Mm -hmm. um, yes. No, actually, and that's what we're saying, right? It, that's a, it, an interesting question. But yeah, no, I mean, and there's, there's very, it, it's, it's a real problem. I mean, that's, you know, people have until July 1st to kind of figure it out, but, you know, woe to him who, or her who's collecting personal information come July 1st, you know. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a big deal. I guess you... Switch the beta. <laughs> Switch so much? Switch updates and, uh, yeah. Um, you know, the other, the other, uh, and it's tough too. I mean, you've got third parties in this app that's out there and you have strict liability as a first party. So, you know, it's not, it's not, and I'm up here giving a presentation on this, but it, it's far from clear what exactly what folks are going to do to comply in some of the you know some of these very sort of practical nuts and bolts questions uh, there's been a lot of chatter out there by uh, lawyers and consultants and all the rest and it's just uh, it's, it, it's it's not clear in many respects what's going to happen is there any oh, sorry. is there any reporting uh, obligation there for example you get that app and you discover oh my god there's 25 to 30 different companies watching what my kid is doing if they're hitting well, so under COPPA, you'd have to um, you'd have to certainly give notice of, of those practices, and then also uh, age gate um, and uh, obtain verifiable parental consent for those for someone who was revealed to be under 13. Uh, it's interesting. One of the things that's buried in one of the footnotes in the final rule in the uh, not in the actual rule itself, but um, in the accompanying commentary, is that you can actually obtain um, uh, you can actually obtain consent um, uh, electronically if there's a if it's associated with a credit card transfer. And there's some uh, a credit card transaction, and so there's some discussion about well, what about the case of like the Apple um, App Store, right, where uh, you have to that's set up with a credit card more or less even if it's a free app you know the person who holds the account gets the email um, and you know there's probably enough uh, there are there's probably a way to make that work in terms of disclosure and consent I think you know the FTC almost contemplated something like that but you know it remains to be seen as does Apple want to have anything to do with getting in the middle of COPPA compliance um, so anyway. with iTunes though you go to the 
grocery store, pay your 10 bucks, get a card. You can set up an account without a credit card. Okay. Well, so maybe you might still have to put in your age. I think it's pretty difficult to not use a credit card. Uh, if you buy but it. Apple knows the difference, right? <laughs> Apple knows whether you're buying with a gift card or a credit card. Well, they, that's true. So that, in principle, they, they could treat the cases differently. Right. right. And what, what, what's interesting about that, I'll get to your question in one second. So what's interesting about that, so let's say that, that if Apple or a third party in the, in the middle of all that uh, <laughs> leverages the, you know, the Apple App Store uh, transactions, even for free apps, to obtain uh, consent or to, to help companies obtain consent, I mean, if that becomes perfunctory, then what's the purpose of having a rule? Too, right. I mean, if it's simply a mat, it, so it's a, yeah. But actually, uh, I'm I'm sorry, uh, on the left there. Have there been any attempts by uh, third-party vendors to create like a um, a consent service where uh, certain okay. sites can sign up, and then you have to register once to the parent, and then you could. If you are registered with the service, you single sign-on for kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know that's a good question. I didn't look. I, I think there are. Um, I, I didn't look into it before the presentation, but I'll certainly I'll look into that and maybe even do an update on the blog. Okay. So one interpretation of this that has been growing on me is okay. We've as a society decided we don't want to do behavioral advertising or these other things with children. And in theory, people could consent, but really the purpose of this is just to choke off this whole realm of activity and say, we're not going to do games targeted to children that are supported by behavioral advertising full stop. And parents can opt in, but really they're not going to. We're just trying to choke off that whole market. Is that what this is about? Uh, no, no. I think the, I think the, the FTC wanted to, you're asking what was the intent? And or, if that's the effect, who exactly will cry? Yeah. So. In terms of the intent, I think the intent by the FTC was, I think it was well-intentioned, and I think they, the, the aim was to, um, you know, create these additional protections, but also enable ways for companies to comply that would be easier than, than what came before, um, because no, they're not, they're not at all looking to, to, kill, to kill off content. And I think any of the, those consequences, and I think there will be some of those, um, are unintended, and I don't think that's the at all what the FTC um, meant to do. Yeah. I mean, you can ask two questions here, right? One question is, what was the FTC trying to do with this rule? The other question is, what was the intention of Congress back when they passed COPPA? Yeah. If you understand what Congress was trying to do and then apply it to today's circumstances, you know, do you end up with something like this? Do you end up with something different? That's another question to ask about intent. Well, this isn't about content, right? This is about business dollars. You can do any content you like, so long as you don't try to monetize it in these ways. Without obtaining verifiable right. consent. No, that's right. But, but the, the practical question then is for, you know, unless someone's totally doing it as a hobby, <laughs> it's anything approaching a commercial enterprise covered by copper. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but that's I, I think that may actually go above and beyond Congress's ability to understand these things, especially at the time they originally passed copyright. Congress's intention was probably to keep first parties from gathering a lot of data about children. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually still just, uh, <laughs> I, I asked a question at the, at the beginning about the third party, and I was talking about Google Analytics, and you were pointing out how this is perhaps a special carve out for what analytics was doing. But actually, I mean, this, uh, most of the data collections in the web ecosystem today are actually not by the first party, they're by the third party. So yeah. it actually still isn't totally obvious to me why the what are the laws, how that impacts the fact that the first party itself is not doing, to a large extent, the data collection. I don't know if I understand your question. I think I might almost understand um, it. So, it. So who is liable when, or, or who, if the first party isn't actually doing the data collection, but is knowingly embedding a third party widget that does data collection for them, um, how does that play under this law? First party is is uh, uh, that, that, right. that game and the third party are all the ad sites that made this web ecosystem happen. Right. So the publisher for the game uh, will have primary primary responsibility to give notice, obtain consent, or in the absence of obtaining consent, not do the collection. And not doing the collection. So they're not actually 
Uh -huh. The law doesn't care. The law says so. When I say not do collection, not have collection occur okay. by them or third parties, okay. and there and it's strict liability. So if there's, uh, um, even if they get no data, like you like you're saying, I think you're exactly right, and it's one of the problems that, again, it's a I think it's a well-intentioned rule, but given how much data is collected by third parties and depending on what they do, it's it's difficult. It puts first parties, especially with a strict liability standard. Um, so anyway, uh, I think obviously you know big players on this will survive. They're going to find a way to comply, and, and uh, uh, particularly the big players that are in the kids content business. Um, others, like I mentioned, um, if it's a small part of what they do or an adjunct to a much larger site, they might just nix it. But I think you know inter interesting question is what happens to websites that are uh, you know, operated by sort of the most marginal commercial entities imaginable or, or people operating commercially, um, you know, with the long tail on the internet, you know, yeah, my kids go on, you know, uh, various sites hosted by big parties, but, um, uh, but my kids, both of whom are under 13, for the most part spend their time, you know, looking for Minecraft mods and Lego creations and Lego NXT and, you know, so here's this this site, and it's uh, brickmodder.net. They uh, they actually do online behavioral advertising on the site. Probably, you know, given the site traffic, don't make that much. But again, for kids, this is this is incredibly uh, cool and interesting content. Um, and you know, is this is this site going to, you know, are they going to have to comply with copper? Do they? Does the FTC do a couple of enforcement actions with smaller sites, and then these people run for the hills on this content? disappears. Um, they don't even have a privacy policy right now, which, you know, might even be an issue under the current, we'll get a boy and deal with that, but. It looks like it's primarily uh, I would say, you know, so the FTC would say, you know, totality, you know, totality test. Uh, and I think if you've got Legos and, and things to build with Legos like this, you know, um, you know, you're going to, you're, you're, you may, you may come out as, you know, child directed. It may not even be mixed audience. I would think, um, possibly, they, they would certainly have to treat it as such. I think, uh, and then this this site for Lego NXT. Um, also, when I was on the site, they did online behavioral ads, and it's uh, and the, this is you know, and if you're a parent, uh, you love it that your kids go on these sites, and then they break out the Legos or they're on. Minecraft and you know demanding that you mod the game and stuff. This is this is um, fantastic and such a great alternative to sort of Black Ops Two, you know. Or um, and again, you know, so here's here's a site, another site um, didn't have a, a privacy policy. They're not there's they're not going to have the resources to to comply. But what happens to this? You know, the long tail of kid directed content, which you know, and they're doing stuff that the big players aren't. You know, the big players are kind of advertising their stuff and hawking their wares, and they got videos. But on the long tail of kids' content is where all the action is for like the coolest stuff on the web. And what happens to that under the final copper rule? Is FTC going to come down hard on a couple, or do they continue to fly under the radar? Why can't they just not do behavioral ads? These sites seems like they don't mean these data. Well, both of these sites. That's a good question. They wouldn't. If they, they could say, okay, we're not going to do behavioral ads, both of those sites had the behavioral ads. So, you know, would they, um, you know, maybe that's what happens. Maybe they take it down. Maybe that's, and they still. The tip jar model. I mean, they, 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 before they had build yeah. days, it was, you know, and then it would be the grown ups. was like, oh, yeah, that's a great site. Okay, I'll give them five bucks. Well, they still do. Can they get money from referrals to merchants? Like, I'm on this site, I click a link to go to Amazon, I buy something on Amazon. Because uh, the purchaser is probably not a not child. That might count as a question. question. Yeah, but by the time you're purchasing, you're sort of implicitly not a child. Yeah, but I, I mean, the question, I guess, too, would be, um, you know, are, is, this, is this going to be a widget, an Amazon widget that's going to collect data whether you go to it or not? I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough case. And, and, and those, those sites aren't, you know, yeah, it's it's almost impossible to think of them complying with with 
with COPPA, I think, just from a resource. We do this kind of referral thing, right? It can just be but a link, yeah. It's actually, just a link. This is actually really interesting, though, because, like, let's say I run a site and I have affirmative knowledge that somebody is a, is a child, and then I have a link, which I know is going to cause an affiliate cookie to get set on that person's machine, but it's not set by me, it's set by Amazon. The question is, uh, what's in that cookie? Is there a unique <laughs> identifier for that user in the cookie, or is it just an affiliate? Typically, yes. Yeah. It's just your affiliate so wait a minute, if you, have a, if you have a child code, site, though, okay. with a link to the New York Times, I, I, I would think you, that would be okay. Because, yeah, once they go off to the New York Times and the New York Times does whatever it's going to do, you know, you, you shouldn't be liable just because you have a link somewhere that's to a, a legal site. Yeah, no, um, no I, th I think that's right. There's been a couple of points here that are, like, worthy of follow-up. I'm going to... I'll hit that on a, on, a, on a blog post. Yeah. So I guess another question would be, if you're sending these links to Amazon, would Amazon then re be responsible? Because they might know that you're a kid's site, right? If they're seeing that all this traffic is coming from this kid's site, and then they watch what these people do and categorize them, would they then be? So, so, well, the actual knowledge standard, I think, is, is higher than that. They would, um, they'd have to receive something in the traffic that would either affirmatively let them know, hey, this person's actually over 13 or receive notice from the site itself, um, all of which is kind of weird I mean, in terms of like how that would happen, and especially for these sites. Um, so uh, just a quote by Jonathan Zitrain. I mean, I think, you know, when he thought of, when he made the, came up with the term the generative internet, you know, I think he was thinking more of code and devices and whatnot, but it, it kind of rang true with what we see in terms of the kid-related content on the long tail sites and, and the things that are going on there. Um, so anyway, um, has anyone heard of the company Curse Inc.? Okay, so Curse Inc. is a um, is is a company that uh, hosts. Um, various forums for uh, online games. So they have a really detailed forum for World of Warcraft and for all sort all of the all the big games that are are not directed to kids. They also have a Minecraft. And it does require mod loader. So this is a leg mine. This is on the site. Show what it looks like. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, um, these are all the Lego blocks. I may have missed one or two, but yeah. So I'm on survival, and I'll show you how long it takes to get rid of the block. And as you see, it doesn't take very long. A few clicks. I mean, we'll do it in a few seconds. Now, guys, I'll show you how the recipes. So first, you'll need leaves and sand. And you'll need if you're not familiar with Minecraft, this is how you sort of concoct your different building scenarios with what you're going to build. So, so anyway, um, and so you can get an idea of certainly the monetization model for Curse Inc. I mean, it's every third party on the planet. It was uh, so. Um, there were, I counted at least 66 different entities that were getting network traffic from the site, all related to analytics and advertising and, you know, God knows what. And, um, but it's a cute video. I mean, it may or may not be, it's, you know, the video may or may not be done by a, a child who's over 13. You can't really tell. Um, and this is a site that my kids visit all the time. Um, it's sort of the clearinghouse for all information, Minecraft. Related, and um, you know, so so the quite so one of the things that again under the final rule under Kappa, um, you know, what what happens to Minecraft? They certainly make a lot. They probably make the majority of their money on all of the other games that they run forums on. Do they want to comply with Kappa? Is that does that fit their business model? You know, the risk analysis or whatnot. I thought Minecraft was. Not a children's game, but it's at least a mixed audience, and maybe most of their players are adults. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, in terms of what, whether or not, but I would be I'd be shocked if most of the players are adults. Uh, 
No, no. Well, no, there's a huge, look, there's a huge community. There's a huge community. You know, and the MindCon thing sold out last year in Paris in like two hours or whatever. And it's attended by thousands, you know, and those aren't kids. So there's a huge community that's devoted to it that's not kids. But, you know, at my house on, on the weekend, it's typical you will see, you know, seven kids. It's every kid within a half a mile is at the dinner table. Laptops all around. You know, I can't even get onto my own router. All the connections are taken. And they're all playing Minecraft. And they're running train mods and railcraft and, you know, building stuff. And, um, and you know, I've got a couple minutes yet. So uh, just, in, just as an example, so my eldest son, who's under 13, on Minecraft, uh, he he made this he made this uh, fortress, of course, because you want to protect yourself from Endermen and creepers and things like this. And so there's a drawbridge that, of course, goes across the hot lava, right? And he has a switch on the outside. You throw the switch. That's right, of course. There has to be hot lava. The glass bridge, you know, manifests itself uh, mechanically with pistons that he's put in there. It comes up over the hot lava. You then go in to the fortress and once you're in the fortress, he can go into the basement, and what he has done with this stuff called redstone, which is essentially the bricks that you use for wiring, has made it so you can throw a switch in the inside that makes the switch on the outside inoperative. You know, it's the type of thing that I did in you know tenth grade physics class with the little bricks and the and, and electrical components and stuff like that. So you know, this is fantastic, and it it it's um, it's troubling that companies are now going to be put in a position. Of is it worth it to have this forum and to have this content um, on the web, or should we just stick to our other stuff and delete it because we don't want to mess with, you know, the compliance obligations, potential liability, etc. Um, you know, age gating. You know, and does it even make sense? Like, if they have a, a part of this, if they, if on my, it's MinecraftForum.net, um, if if you put in your your date of birth and if and you know, if if most of the users are kids, and maybe there's enough that it, that aren't, but let's say you know a, a child, um, you know, puts in their information as being under 13, then you know they can't if they don't obtain parental consent, their entire business model goes away. Um, is it worth it for them to have it for that reason too? You know, risk and anyway. Uh, so, and the very last thought in the final two minutes. But I'll stay later if anyone wants to. The um, is there was a dissenting vote uh, by uh, Commissioner Olhausen, the most recent member of the FTC, I think, and in voting for the final rule, she voted against it. And uh, so um, her thought was that the the original the existing COPPA statute doesn't authorize. Uh, uh, rules against um, third parties. She says, I believe a core provision of the amendments exceeds the scope of the authority granted us by Congress. Um, and I don't have the, <laughs> the business part of that quote. But the, re the reason is this, is it says here that it's unlawful for an operator of a website or online service directed to children to collect personal information. Um, and so uh, Commissioner Olhausen's point is, well, how is it possible that if this is the statutory authority, that that allows um, that allows the FTC to then regulate the third party uh, collection of information? What the, FT the FTC hooked onto this definition in the uh, defining operator under COPPA, and it says, uh, you know, that an operator is uh, uh, an entity that collects information or uh, 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 from or about the users, da, da 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 da, or on whose behalf such information is collected or maintained, and so they kind of work that into the justification. But you know, I don't know. I think I think you know, given a dissenting vote and given this language, which is really this is the prohibition language. This is just the definition of whether you're an operator. A judge might look at this and say, look, you know, the new the final rule under COP is a great idea. I think as a judge and should be the law, but that doesn't matter. Congress didn't say it, so go back and complain to Congress. Um, you know, that would be the argument. The, the corresponding argument by the FTC would be, no, this is enough. Come on, get over it. You know, the rule's fine. So we might see that rule coming up. That's pretty much all I had, unless there were questions.
But you look, but looking at that, it looks like it makes like what on the line of analysis should resolve people. They yes, fine. The third party is not right. We find it that way. But the first party is liable for the third party's actions. But the first party may not be liable for the third party's actions. That's not what you mean. Yeah, no, that's right. No, I think that's right. It's the first party being on the hook for the third party actions is that's exactly where the rub is that Commissioner Old has identified. Yeah. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Do you have any sense what the justification was in the first place for all of this? Like, what? Why is it that, as a twelve-year-old, it's not good to collect information, but for a fourteen-year-old, it's okay, and for an eighteen-year-old, it's absolutely fine? You know, I think they just they drew the line somewhere, and probably you know has to do with the thoughts around what's the age that you know children can make. Their judgments about content. But yeah, that treat two year olds one way and 18 year olds another way. There has to be some line you draw in between. Them, right? Um, so why they chose 13 was Congress's judgment about when the uh, about balancing the interests in having older kids with better judgment and who get more autonomy under the law, the ability to do a lot of stuff versus a more protective attitude toward younger kids. And they chose to draw the line at that place. Which, by the way, right, is the line where we send them to high school, so it's like not entirely out of sync with other lines we draw. And it's a category we use in talking about the stages of life. These are pre-teens. It had a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> not. Congress could have said pre or post bar mitzvah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a pretty good understanding of how their information is used online. Which I so why not? Do you think it's fixable? It's a final rule. Well, do you think it's broken? Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually do think it's broken. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know. How is it, it fixable? So, um, I think I, I my first. This is my personal view. I, I don't know how widely held it is, but I. Uh, I think that the, the original definition of, or the original concept of personal information is probably closer to what was envisioned in the statute and probably also fairly reflects the concern uh, that Congress had as well as parents have, et cetera, about the information collected by children. You know, knowing what a UDID is and that Flurry has it and TapJoy Ads has it, I don't really care that they have my kids' UDID. I mean, there could be, there's scenarios where it could be a bad thing. But I'm more concerned that if a third party has first and last name, my kid, phone number, address, then I'm creeped out. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, I'm not saying that that you know that there is, that there shouldn't be some sort of working your way into the third party ecosystem to manage what's going on. But I think what you know instead of sort of the incremental working the way forward, I think what we have in this rule is the jumping in, you know, feet first. Uh, so I think it goes just. Personal opinion, I think reasonable minds can absolutely differ on this, um, but I think it goes a little too far in that direction. But it's, it's interesting, right? Because in the HIPAA rule, there is an, sort of an enumerated list of fields that you can't have. And if you don't have those fields, then you're anonymous for the purposes of the law. And so people pass around lots of anonymized data that is, of course, perfectly identifying. Um, and, um, but they're allowed to do that, and there's no. Limit. Well, it's because they changed the rule. So let's say you have a website. Oh, or you, yeah. Every one of these websites that we're concerned might go the out and if, <laughs> rather than comply with, with um, uh, COPPA. If they instead ask a third party to act as the gateway. So you go to this website, you verify that you're a parent, you give your permission for your child to be tracked, it puts a cookie on your computer, and then you go to any one of these websites, they see the cookie and they'll serve you content. You don't have the cookie. Then you get nothing. Would that be a potential way to satisfy this? You know, the devil's always in the details, but I think like a potential solution for that would be great and like yeah, you know, but help. if you had such a system, then um, it could be that every site requires you to do this, and it's just a blanket. Uh, like instead of going to each site and just and the parent deciding, I want the site to track my child, or I don't want the site to, they only get one choice. Is that this third, this one website where they say. It's okay for everything to be tracked. 
Um, at, at which point, it's not really a choice anymore. It's versus right. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the other thing that's sort of interesting on the uh, the behavioral advertising point, there was a post on um, Arvin's blog. Is it Narion? Narion. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the, it was a post I think that he had done with Jonathan Mayer from Stanford, uh, and it dealt with you know do I have to be tracked when there's behavioral advertising going on? <laughs> so it talked about a solution where the sort of tracking aspect happens on the client side, and then there's you know third-party ad delivery that's sort of blind to any of the um, of the behavioral information, etc. Uh, relating to you. It's all done locally, so it's not shared with other parties. Um, it was actually pretty fascinating, and I wonder if like solutions like that, sort of a way around, kind of satisfying everybody's concerns. It would help with the monetization model for the for folks, um, but also it could, could, totally removes the issue of, you know, got all this information, and trackable information going yeah. to other parties. There's a, there's a, there are several papers now been published about privacy-preserving approaches to behavioral advertising. It's still pretty early in Very the development context. of that, but um, but there's a bunch of ideas about how to do it. One of them is client side collection. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.